I'm Deacon John Fellner, and my job is to introduce my wife, Dr. Maura Herdenfelder. And uh, she received her uh, PhD from Marquette University and has teaching, been teaching uh, theology for about 20 years or maybe a little more, and still teaches online for uh, this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so together we're going to pray this prayer from St. Augustine. Augustine, uh, Name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Too late have I loved you, O beauty so ancient, O beauty so new. Too late have I loved you, you were within me, but I was outside myself. And there I saw you. In my weakness, I ran after the beauty of the things you have made. You were with me, and I was not with you. The things you have made kept me from you. The things which would have known me unless they existed in you. You have called, you have cried, and you have pierced my deafness. You have radiated forth, and you have shown my heart brightly. And you have dispelled my blindness. You have sent forth your fragrance, and I have breathed it in, and I long for you. I have tasted you, and I hunger and thirst for you. You have touched me, and I ardently desire your peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, tonight we are here to talk about the Mass, and first of all, I have to thank all of you for coming out, because I know the weather is a little dicey sometimes, uh, and uh, so I appreciate your coming out tonight. Um, the Mass. The thing I want to stress tonight is that the Mass is a journey. It is actually a journey to heaven and back. And I'm not just speaking metaphorically, I mean that literally. <coughs> The church's whole reason for being is to serve as a gateway between the earthly and the heavenly realms. It brings people to God, and it brings God to his people. And the Mass is the church's primary means for achieving this goal. So this evening, I'm going to walk you through some of the highlights of that mystical journey, and then when I'm finished, uh, Deacon John is going to put in his two cents with a, a few words about some of the items that are used on the altar and, and some other thoughts. Um, I had to use this picture because um, this is the Sacre Coeur in Paris, if any of you have been there. Yeah. And it's, it's the, I think the travel guide said it's perched like a wedding cake on the highest point in <laughs> Paris. And it looks like a journey to heaven. Um, actually, the steps are probably more purgatorial. But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But it looks like a journey. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of a journey for most of us. Okay, so the journey begins at the entryway of the church. So imagine that you have just stepped out of the chaos, the confusion, the stress, and the heartache of the secular world. And now you are into this peaceful stillness of a sacred space. Now, ideally, churches should be built to flood your senses with the knowledge that you, when you have stepped inside, you are no longer in the ordinary world. You have stepped into a world that is set apart, a world that is timeless and transcendent. You have soaring ceilings that move your eyes upward. The smell of incense and lit candles should permeate the air reminding you of the prayers that are rising to heaven. And for this, I thought it would be fun to just use some very famous places. Um, the largest picture here is Saint-Chapelle again in Paris. And it's, it's a, just a jewel box. And you can see the little teeny people sitting along the side. And you see how big it is. Um, the black and white picture is from the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela, and I put that in there because, let me look at the size of that sensor, wow! <laughs> um, and then the other picture is, is from the shrine at Fatima. Um, some of the beauty of the church. One of the first things you might notice as you enter the church is the holy water dish or font. And we dip our fingers into the holy water and make the sign of the cross. And this is to recall our baptismal promises, to remain faithful to God, and to call on the power of the Trinity 
to cleanse us of our sins. This is a sacramental. It's different from a sacrament. It's a sacramental. It relies on faith. But it is there to cleanse us of the minor sins, the venial sins, because we have to kind of brush the dirt off uh, that we have accumulated during the week, brush the dirt off of our souls as we get ready for this journey that we're going to take that is actually going to bring us into contact with the Lord our God. Then as you enter the main body of the church, you may notice images of saints in the stained glass windows, in statues and paintings that adorn the church walls. Um, these images serve as reminders of the fact that we are all members of this enormous family. It's a family that stretches back in time and into the future and all across the globe. It's important to acknowledge the invisible presence of these people because these are the people who are cheering us on as we go through the trials of life. These are the people who can intercede for us because they know all about troubles with finances, family relationships, illnesses, insults, injuries, spiritual dryness, and feelings of loneliness, you name it, they have been there. Um, Saint Teresa, that's the sculpture piece here, Teresa of Avila, um, struggled with spiritual dryness for a very long time, for many, many years, in fact. Uh, St. Thomas More, who is the, in the stained glass window in the middle, uh, he certainly knows what it's like to fall from political favor. He was a wealthy man in England, and he fell from political favor. Actually, it cost him his life. But he also knew what kind of stress that put on his family. He was a family man, and that worried him. He knew what that was all about. Um, St. Oscar Romero was a bishop in El Salvador. He was actually diagnosed with um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Right? Um, both the Little Flower and St. Mother Teresa struggled with terrible temptations to disbelief and to atheism. St. Francis and St. Clair didn't get along with their families. Uh, many, many saints have been plagued with illness and poverty. There is a patron saint for every difficulty you can imagine. And these are really good people to get to know. That's why you see them in the church. The focal point of the church is that small decorated box that we call the tabernacle. Now the word tabernacle comes from the Latin equivalent for the Hebrew word mishkan, which meant dwelling place. The Old Testament tabernacle, or mishkan, referred to the portable tent that housed the Ark of the Covenant, literally God's dwelling place on earth. And just to explain this picture, this is one of my favorites. Um, on your left, on the far end there, you see the Ark of the Covenant. And just to refresh your memory, the Ark was in the Holy of Holies. It was the holiest thing that the Jewish people had in their possession. It housed the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, a golden jar with some of the manna that had sustained the people as they wandered in the desert, and Aaron's staff that had flowered to help them determine who the priesthood would be. All of these things are housed in the Ark of the Covenant. And it was separated, the Holy of Holies is separated from the rest of the tent with this curtain. Now just to the right of the curtain, I think, yeah, just to the right of the curtain, you see a priest who is standing in front of a, an altar where he offers sacrifice. He's holding a censer for incensing, and you can see the flames of the sacrifice. Behind him, against the wall, you see that gold-plated table with the sacrifice called the bread of presence that we talked about in the second talk, if you were here, the bread of presence, which foreshadows what we do with the Eucharist. And then the last thing in the foreground is a stylized candlestick called a menorah. And the menorah, um, as I mentioned, I think in, I don't know, one or two of these talks, um, it was a stylized <coughs> tree of life meant to recall the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And it was kept lit all the time. So this is literally God's dwelling place on earth. And I mean that. 
Numbers 9, 15 through 16 says, quote, Now on the day that the tabernacle was erected, the cloud covered the tabernacle. The tent of the testimony, it was also called the tent of meeting. And in the evening, it was like the appearance of fire over the tabernacle until morning. So it was continuously. The cloud would cover it by day and the appearance of fire by night. Today, we have a new ark of the new covenant established through the blood of Christ. The consecrated Eucharist is literally the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, who is both God and man. He is our manna from heaven. And this manna is housed in our tabernacle, which is literally God's dwelling place on earth because Christ is God. This is why the tabernacle receives pride of place in Catholic churches. It is either front and center, as it is at St. Bernard's, or in larger churches, it might be in a special chapel that is designated as a throne room fit for a king. And it should be a throne room fit for a king. We're not shoving him off into a little closet. Either way, a person Entering a Catholic church should know immediately where the tabernacle is because that is where our Lord and King is. That's the host of the house that we have entered. And there is a candle called a tabernacle lamp. It's the red candle in this picture. And that remains lit 24 hours a day, seven days a week next to the tabernacle in honor of the presence of our Lord. When the Lord is removed from the tabernacle, the, the tabernacle lamp is put out. It's only there to tell you he's there. Now this custom actually comes from the Old Testament. Exodus 27, 20 to 21 says, Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning. In the tent of meeting, outside the curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant law, Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. As we gaze at the tabernacle, we remember Christ's great sacrifice. We remember how the Son, the infinite, omnipotent second person of the Trinity, willingly joined himself with our humanity, taking on all of our limitations and all of our sufferings. And to get an idea of what kind of a sacrifice this was, I often like to say, imagine uniting your person with a garden slug. Right? Imagine the limitations that you would suffer intellectually, in terms of your mobility, in terms of your lifespan, every single thing about you would be so very limited in this garden slug. Well, God is at, at least as far above us as we are as far above a, gar a garden slug, right? That gives you an idea of what he did for us. This is why, actually, when we get to that part of the Nicene Creed where we say, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. The instructions in the Missalette tell us to bow on that line. We're bowing in humble reverence and thanksgiving and recognition for the unimaginable gift that he gave us simply by uniting his infinite, omnipotent, divine self to our very frail and limited humanity. Then, of course, we have to ponder how the world thanked the Lord for this gift. We thanked him by torturing and killing him. And he took it all, loving us to the very end, pleading with the Father to forgive us. So if we think about this, we become overwhelmed by the Lord's limitless love and majesty. And so, we fall to one knee in genuflection, giving this small gesture of adoration to him before we settle into our pew. 
Now, before Mass begins, we have a few moments to settle our minds and our hearts and ask the Lord for forgiveness for all the ways that we have contributed to his pain. This time of quiet prayer and recollection is very important. We need this time to shift our focus from all of our worldly cares. What am I going to fix for dinner tonight? I can't believe what the kids did to me today. You know, all of these things that are going through our minds, right? We have to shift so that we can focus on the fact that we are about to receive the Lord of the universe into our bodies and souls. We have to shift so that our minds and our hearts are open to the graces that he wants to give us. Finally, the priest, the deacon, the altar servers, and sometimes the lectors are ready to begin the processional. Now, during the Mass, as we've discussed, as we discussed at length last time, the priest is our mediator between humanity and God. He acts in the person of Christ when he says the Mass. But he also represents us as we travel from the sinful chaos of the world to greet the divine majesty. So the priest and all who serve on the altar process from the front door of the church to the altar the, representing the spiritual journey that we are all about to make. His clothing is purposely otherworldly and stately. The black shirt and pants that he usually wears symbolize poverty and the need to die to sin and selfishness. Now they are covered with a white alb, A-L-B, that symbolizes Christ's righteousness as we have received it through baptism. And then he has that colored cape-like garment over that, which is called a chasuble. The colors of the chasuble represent the current liturgical season. The chasuble is made so that it's seamless because it is made to be like the cloaks that were worn by the ancient Jewish priests, which were seamless, and by ancient Jewish bridegrooms who wore the same thing. It represents the desire to take on the sweet yoke of Christ's charity. <coughs> so now the congregation stands to greet the procession and all it represents. We will continue to stand throughout the opening ceremonies to demonstrate our attention and our readiness for the journey. We're getting ready. The congregation sings during the procession. We're singing in joyful anticipation of the journey that's about to begin. We will sing in various places during the Mass. Sometimes we'll sing hymns. Sometimes we'll chant prayers. The music during the Mass is a powerful instrument of inspiration. Music, like the visual arts, is meant to draw our hearts and minds into the majesty of the moment. Music has a wonderful way of reaching your heart. It bypasses the intellect and goes straight for the heart. In fact, according to section 110, or 112 of Vatican II's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, which is called Sacrosanctum Concilium, quote, the musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. The main reason for this preeminence is that as sacred song united to the words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. It adds delight to prayer, fosters unity of minds, or confers greater solemnity upon the sacred rites." End quote. So the music during the liturgy is part of the prayer. And it's very important for us all to participate. It doesn't really matter if you can't carry a tune in a bucket. It doesn't matter. We're all called to make a joyful noise for the Lord. It's part of the prayer. Once at the altar, the priest turns to greet the congregation, and he wishes us peace. Now, this is not the liturgical equivalent of saying, have a nice day, or even hello. Right? This is a desire for us to share in the particular peace that Christ established between God and the world that warred against him. <clears throat> This peace may not come with warm, fuzzy feelings. It may not guarantee peaceful human relationships. 
In fact, it will probably result in some sort of turmoil and suffering while we are in the world because the world is still warring against God. But this peace does indeed guarantee us an eternity of bliss with God in heaven and internal calm in this life, even as we face all of its challenges and heartaches. Next, the priest leads us in the penitential rite. Here we acknowledge our sins and ask for the intercession of all our brothers and sisters in heaven and on earth, especially the Blessed Virgin, and we pray for God's forgiveness. The two prayers in the penitential rite are the confitier, during which we actually strike our breasts three times, acknowledging that we have sinned through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault, three times. And, the, and then there's the Kyrie, of course, the Lord have mercy, where we ask in a beautiful symmetry three times for God's mercy. Three times my fault, three times I ask for mercy. At last, we're ready to finally get started. So during most of the year, we begin by singing the Gloria. We skip it during Lent and Advent because of the penitential nature of the season. The Gloria expresses our joyful anticipation of heaven. It consists of an acknowledgement of the peace that Christ established between heaven and earth so that we can actually make this journey. And it also uses all sorts of wonderful titles that are drawn from both the Old and the New Testaments. After the Gloria, the priest says a very short prayer called the Collect. Looks like collect in English. Um, he gathers, he collects all of our intentions as we set forth on the journey so that we can present them to the Lord. Now our mystical journey begins in the liturgy of the word. Darn, I wished Dan Benware was here to see himself on the screen. Oh well. Um, this part of the Mass takes its inspiration from Jewish synagogue services, which focused on the scriptural readings and the lessons learned from them. So here, we get to sit down. <laughs> We're going to settle in into our pews and focus our attention on the words of the Lord. And I have to put a little shout out here to our Protestant friends, because the only reason that Catholic churches have pews at all is because we adopted the Protestant custom of having pews. Before that, if you, if you go into the historical churches, people either stood or they knelt on that really hard floor. Um, but for Protestants, the main focus of their service was the sermon. And sometimes those sermons would go on for hours, so they had to sit down. <laughs> and we said, hey, that looks like a good idea. Let's sit down, right? So, okay, so we're going to settle into our pews, and we focus our attention on the words of the Lord. And it's important to understand that we're not simply hearing about a message that was delivered to God's people many centuries ago. The messages of scripture are timeless. When we hear scripture, we are hearing God speaking to us right here and now. He's speaking to us personally. It's also important to understand that all of those heroes and saints from scripture, both Old and New Testaments, are very real and very much alive in Christ. And that means that they are right there with you in the church, listening with us, praying with us as we tell their stories. The angels and the saints are always with us. They're right here, right now. We are never, 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 ever alone. Wonderful thing. During most of the year, we will hear one passage from one of the Old Testament narratives, an Old Testament psalm, a New Testament reading from either the letters, the Acts of the Apostles, or Revelation, and then finally the last thing we're going to read is going to be a selection from one of the four Gospels. Now during the Easter season, the first, the Old Testament reading is actually replaced by a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, and the Acts of the Apostles is the book that tells about the founding of the early church. So we make that substitution during the Easter season because of the season's focus on the resurrection. But then we're going to go back to the Old Testament readings. So I'd like to think, just think. Saints Peter and Paul and all of the apostles are right there in the church with us as we hear about all of their adventures. I wonder what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah? I wonder what they're thinking as they listen. Now, as I mentioned, 
The last reading selection is from one of the four Gospels. And if you recall, we stand to listen to this reading. Why do we do that? Because the Gospels focus directly on the life of Christ and his teaching. And Christ is our new lawgiver. Right? He is the person who gave us the new law and the new covenant. The recitation, or standing for the recitation of the law of God is a custom that again goes back to the Old Testament. The Jews stood for the reading and the renewal of the law of Moses. And if you're curious about it and you want to look it up, it's mentioned in Nehemiah 8.5. After the gospel reading, we can once again settle into our seats. Either the priest or deacon is about to deliver the homily. Both the gospel and the homily must be proclaimed by an ordained minister. That would be either a deacon, a priest, or a bishop. This is because their ordination and their proclamation of it is a sign of the church's apostolic authority. The word homily comes from a Greek word that means explanation. The homily is an explanation of the readings and an application to the lives of the faithful. The ordained minister who delivers the homily is speaking in the name of the church and he's clarifying the apostolic faith. So unlike sermons, which could be that minister's personal take on whatever it is you've just read, homilies are supposed to, um, homilies do not consist, I'm sorry, homilies do not consist of personally held opinions. Now the person delivering the homily might use a personal example, they might use an example to illustrate a point, but the main message of the homily expresses the apostolic faith. He's not speaking from his individual human intellect. He is encompassing the tradition of the church. <clears throat> now that we have revisited the great works of God in scripture, it's our turn to speak. We rise to recite the Nicene Creed because the creed is both a statement of faith and a sacred oath to live that faith. And standing is the proper posture for the declaration of an oath. The Creed is a, an extremely rich prayer. It was written between the years 325 and 381 during two different worldwide or ecumenical councils. It was the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. In fact, the full name of the Creed is actually the Nicene-Constantinopolitan Creed, but that's way too much of a mouthful, so we always just shorten it to the Nicene Creed. Each line in this prayer is very carefully crafted to combat particular heresies and misunderstandings about the Trinity and the life of Christ. And I have to say, many of these errors that were around in the fourth century are alive and well today. They keep recycling, such as belief that the Son is somehow less than the Father, or that God, the God of the Old Testament is somehow different from the God of the New Testament. I could go on for hours just talking about each line in the creed, but I won't. We remain standing for something called the universal prayers. These are the petitions that either a deacon or a lector reads as the whole assembly prays for the world at large, the church, and local concerns. It was customary in the ancient Jewish synagogue services to offer prayers in the forms of litanies. And these intercessions were incorporated into Christian worship very early on. In the year 153 AD, St. Justin Martyr wrote apologies to the pagan world. And here apologies are rational or reasoned defenses of the faith. They're not saying they're sorry. They're explaining the faith. So. In his first apology, he describes the structure of the Mass, which is remarkably similar to our own. In fact, if you got that book, uh, Behold It As I, I think that the authors even have a chart um, talking about how similar the structure is. Okay, so he stated, quote, there were common prayers that we fervently offer for ourselves, for our brothers, and for the rest of men, wherever they may be testifying to the presence of universal prayers. 
We are, in the words of 1 Peter 2.9, a chosen race, a royal priesthood. All of us are, by virtue of our baptism. This means that it is our duty and our privilege to offer the whole world to Christ, believers and non-believers alike, so that the whole world might be saved. Those of us who are baptized share in the common priesthood of the faithful, and we exercise it by interceding for and offering the world to Christ. We do this specifically during the Mass, when we join in the universal prayers and in the offertory. The offertory marks the transition from the Liturgy of the Word to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Representatives from the assembly bring the bread and wine and monetary offerings to the altar. The bread and wine are the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands that the Holy Spirit will transform into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, the great sacrifice. I am, after the priest receives the gifts, he implores the Lord on behalf of the assembly. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you. This prayer is drawn from the courageous words of Azariah in Daniel 3, 39 to 40, as he prays from within a fiery furnace. If you all remember that story, he says, he's thrown into the furnace because Nebuchadnezzar is mad at him, doesn't like him. He throws him into the furnace. But um, Azariah, otherwise known as um, Abednego, does not die. And he prays. Yet, though it were with burnt offerings of rams and bulls, or with tens of thousands of fat lambs, such may our sacrifice be in your sight today, and may we unreservedly follow you, for no shame will come to those who trust in you. The priest then washes his hands according to the precedent that was set by the ancient Jewish Levite priests, who washed their hands before performing their priestly duties in the temple before, and their priestly duties in the temple were to perform sacrifices. Today's priests pray a prayer of contrition taken from King David's Psalm 51.2. Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Uh, we talked a little bit after, during the Q&A last week about whether or not a priest can offer a valid mass if he is in a state of very serious sin. And the answer to that question is, yes, he can. That is a protection for us, so that we can receive the sacraments. It does not bode well for the priest. So the priest tries to cleanse himself from sin before he, he offers the sacrifice. When the Jewish temple was still standing, the heart of Jewish worship was sacrifice. Jewish priests offered sacrifices year-round on behalf of their people. The synagogue also existed, but the synagogue services were supplemental opportunities to study sacred scripture and pray. The real essence of worship was in the temple sacrifices. And the high point of the Jewish liturgical year was the Feast of Passover, which featured sacrificial lambs immolated on a cross in remembrance of the Lamb's blood that saved the Israelites from death, which was brought about by the tenth plague that God sent to the Pharaoh so that he would free them from slavery in Egypt. When Jesus celebrated his Last Supper with his apostles, it was a Passover meal. Only this time, Jesus was the Lamb, immolated on the cross, and his people were saved from the slavery of sin and spiritual death. The liturgy of the Eucharist takes its basic structure from the celebration of the Lord's Supper, which was Jesus' final Passover celebration with some alterations. He commanded his apostles to do this in remembrance of me, and they did, immediately. There are references to this celebration in Scripture itself. Jesus celebrates the first post-resurrection Mass in the story known as the Road to Emmaus. And Paul references the Eucharistic celebrations in 1 Corinthians. Now, in our services, the priest reads a series of prayers 
called the Eucharistic Prayers, during which he calls upon the Holy Spirit to transform the substance of the bread and wine into the substance of Christ's body, blood, soul, and divinity. And it's customary to ring bells to underscore the moment of this consecration, draw our attention to it. During the Eucharistic prayers, the assembly joins in the singing of something called the Sanctus, or the Holy Holy, which is taken from Isaiah 6.3 and Revelation 4.8. Isaiah 6.3 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Um, Revelation 4.8 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. When we sing this, all the angels and saints join with us to sing this great hymn of praise. In fact, the priest even says that to introduce the Sanctus. With all the angels and saints, we are going to sing. We kneel from the end of the Sanctus until the great Amen, which is the sung Amen, because we are witnessing the great Lord of heaven and earth descend upon our altar. Heaven is coming into our reality. God is coming into our reality. This is the great sacrifice. After the whole line of prayers called the Eucharistic prayers, we say the Lord's Prayer. And we stand to address God the Father. We ask that God's name be hallowed and revered throughout the world. And that at long last, finally, God's will really will reign on earth as it does in heaven. We ask that, like the Jews wandering in the desert, we will be sustained by the Lord's heavenly manna. Only our manna is the Lord himself in the Eucharist. So we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And the Greek word that is translated daily bread in English is actually epiousius, which literally means super substantial bread. The early church fathers believed that this was referring to the Eucharist. We are praying that, in addition to meeting our material needs, the Lord will sustain us with the Eucharist until we reach our heavenly promised land. Right? And I think the, uh, our experiences of the last couple of years have maybe taught us how precious that is. The Eucharist could be taken away from us. We're praying that it's not. We're praying that we always have it until we reach our heavenly promised land. Finally, we pray that we are given the grace to forgive and to avoid sin and to be kept away from the clutches of the evil one, who is quite real. After asking for the ability to forgive and avoid sin, we turn to our neighbors and extend a sign of peace, knowing that we cannot love God and hate any one of his children. We must reconcile. Then we sing, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, grant us peace. These words recall the words of John the Baptist, who upon seeing Christ at the Jordan cried out in, one, in John 1:29. 1, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. At last, we are ready to complete our journey to heaven. Through the priest's words, heaven has opened up for us and been made present to us on the altar. Christ's eternal sacrifice of himself is now available to us. We can literally reach out and touch him. Christ, our heavenly bridegroom, awaits us and we humbly approach to take him into our bodies and souls. This is the fountain that quenches all thirst. This is the banquet that satisfies all hunger. Pray that the Lord opens your heart to his grace. Pray in the words of Saint Padre Pio, Jesus, stay with me, stay with me. Our journey to heaven is complete. The priest offers a final blessing, and the priest or the deacon commands us, go forth, the mass is ended. 
Now we have a mission. We are commanded. We have received our Lord, and it is our duty to go out into the world and make the world holy. We are to be Christ's hands and feet, bringing every soul, every intimately and infinitely loved soul, back home to him. We are to make what is ugly beautiful, what is false true, what is evil good. We are to play our part in the transformation of the world so that God's will actually is done on earth as it is in heaven. Does that seem impossible? Of course it is for us mere mortals. But for God, all things are possible. And we have just received the Lord into our bodies and hearts. And so with God's grace, all good things are indeed possible. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to my husband, and he is going to show you a couple of other things here. Let's say a couple of other words. You won't be using this anymore. Okay. I'm going to turn that off then. Yeah, that was a good picture of me. So we spent the last five week uh, Wednesday nights exploring the mystery and beauty of uh, Catholic worship, focusing on the Eucharist, the source and summit of our Christian life. And I strongly suspect that we've been preaching to the choir, as the cliche would say. Or Dr. Mora has been talking with you, the believers, the faithful Catholics who believe in transubstantiation, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And I suspect this because when I'm on the altar serving at Mass, I can see that you believe. I see the reverence that you pay to the real presence of Jesus in the tabernacle. I see the way you participate in the Mass. I see the joy in your eyes when I distribute Holy Communion and Jesus physically enters your body. And I see how you pray after receiving Communion. We are the faithful Catholics, the Holy Remnant. Unfortunately, many Catholics don't share this belief, and perhaps some of us, me included, have had moments of doubt. So please remember, that having doubt is not the same as not believing. I think you'll agree that Dr. Mora has made a compelling case for the Catholic belief in transubstantiation. She has reminded us of, uh, she has reminded us of the sacramental worldview, explained what the Eucharist is, why we believe it, and why we need the priesthood, and even highlighted some Eucharistic miracles. She's given us the reason to believe but only the Holy Spirit can give us the faith to internalize the belief. Remember, our call is to evangelize, does not include the conversion of souls. That task is reserved to the Holy Spirit. We plant and water the seeds of faith, and the Holy Spirit takes over and converts the heart. And we're glad that he's on our team. Now, here are some very sobering and sad statistics. According to a 2019 Pew Research, 69% of all Catholics do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That survey goes on to state, quote, <clears throat> overall 43% of Catholics believe that the bread and wine are symbolic, and they also believe that this reflects the position of the Catholic Church. They think that the Catholic Church teaches that the consecrated bread and wine are symbolic, not the real presence. Still, one in five Catholics even reject the idea of, of transubstantiation, even though they know about the church's teachings. And when they broke it down by age and focused on those under the age of 40, they found that 74% do not believe in the real presence. Again, that's 74% of our younger people these are the future leaders of our church. These are the parents raising the next generation of Catholics. And most of them do not understand or even believe in this essential element of our faith. These are staggering figures, and they have certainly caught the attention of our bishops. And that is why our bishops are focusing on the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And that is one of the reasons we're here today. The Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us 
that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our Christian faith because it's Jesus himself who communes with us under the appearance of or the accidents of bread and wine. And when we eat this super substantial bread of life, Jesus physically enters our body to give us supernatural strength or what we call sacramental grace. And the more faith we have, the more grace God can give us. Now this is the most intimate encounter we will have with God this side of heaven. At every Mass, if we have the faith, we will be mystically present at the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we will join him at the eternal banquet. And how sad it is that such a large number of people attending Mass do not believe that God is physically present. And it's even sadder that they are unable to receive all the graces God wants to give us. God will not force himself on us, even if we eat the tree of life by consuming the precious body, blood, and soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Because the amount of grace that we receive from the sacrament is always in proportion to the receptivity that we have for the sacrament. God will not give something we don't want. He won't do it because he gave us that free will. We have to choose it. Without faith, we undermine the graces that God wants to give us. God will not give us something that we're not prepared for or we don't want. And that's why we prepare for the Mass. That's why we pray. That's why we all leads up to the uh, Eucharistic prayer and the consecration. And then we receive him in our, in our mouth and, and take him into our body. And that's what we've, ta uh, we've focused on today. And that's what the book, uh, Heaven and Back, is trying to instill in us. The importance of faith in preparing ourselves to receive the Holy Eucharist. We want it all, and God wants to fill our desires. He wants to pour out the grace we need in proportion to our ability to accept it. But we have to cooperate with God and have the faith, because that is a key element to God's plan for our salvation. Without this precious gift, the gift of the Eucharist, we lose the surest and most powerful means of salvation, a gift which becomes the spiritual foundation of all the good works that we wish to accomplish in this life. So why have so many people drifted away from the church's teachings on the real presence? And could our lack of faith explain why our church pews are less full? I'm sure there are a lot of other reasons, but our lack of faith in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is a major reason. Without this belief, the belief in the real presence. Why go to a Catholic church? Why not simply go to a more convenient and less demanding non-Catholic service? Or for that matter, why go to church at all? If God is everywhere, why can't we simply commune with him in nature and be spiritual? Have you heard that before? I'm spiritual, not religious. I've heard that many times. And if you're like me, you have family, friends, and neighbors who no longer attend Mass. And we can point fingers in every direction to explain why, but that doesn't solve the problem. So what can we do? What can this group of faithful Catholics do? How can we reach out to our family, friends, neighbors, who have drifted away from church teachings? Well, here are a few simple things we can do. Things that we're already doing. All we have to do is do them more deliberately, with a little more emphasis. Be more obvious in our reverent postures and gestures. Allow those around you to see your piety. Lead silently, silently by example. Remember the statistics. A large percentage of people sitting next to you in church do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Whether we like it or not, People judge us by our actions. And when we show the respect that God deserves, a message is sent not only to our family, friends, and neighbors, but to those we don't even know. The first thing we should do is to re-examine our own understanding of the Eucharist. And if we have doubts, pray earnestly to our Lord to help our unbelief. And then, 
Let us not be afraid to talk about our religious beliefs and not be afraid to ask our children, grandchildren, friends, and neighbors to join us at Mass. Let us show by example that we respect the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist by dressing appropriately for Mass. Let us arrive early to Mass so that we have time to meditate and reflect upon the great mystery we are about to experience. Let us sign ourselves with holy water when we enter the church. Let us genuflect or bow down before the tabernacle as we enter the pew. Let us silence our thoughts as we prepare for the Mass and actively participate in the songs, hymns, and responses during the Mass. Let us bow down when we reference the incarnation of Christ during the creed. And let us kneel during the consecration if you're able to. And most importantly, let us approach the reception of our Lord and Savior during the distribution of Holy Communion with great reverence. We should bow before we receive. And if we receive in the hand, we should form a holy throne with our hands, the strong hand under our weak hand, and say an audible amen and reverently consume the Eucharist. These physical gestures speak louder than words. And we should do these things purposefully and reverently, knowing that you are being seen by those around you. Now, there will be times when we are distracted, running late, angry, run down, or simply not in the right frame of mind to fully participate and be as reverent as we should. But these should be the exception, not the rule. Remember, we are the faithful Catholics, the holy remnant, and we can lead by our good example. So please join me in these simple steps and let us reinvigorate the beauty and dignity of the Holy Mass by showing the reverence that God deserves. Now I want to just go over here and uh, just show you some of the, um, the, uh, the items that we use during Mass because they're all consecrated, they're all holy. You'll notice there is a a tablecloth over this, and this is a sacred cloth that covers the, t- the altar. The altar is actually where the sacrifice of the Mass is going to take place. And I'm sure you recognize a lot of these items, uh, but just to show you, the, all of them uh, that house the precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ are made of precious metal, usually gold, gold-plated, or they're always very special. And uh, uh, this is the chalice, which we'll get the blood from and the ciborium, where we put the rest of the hosts when we're going to distribute them during Holy Communion. Then we have something called the paten, and this is the larger host that you, Father uses during the consecration when he lifts it up and shows everybody during the uh, consecration of the host. And they're all made out of precious metal. And that's done for a reason, because it's the, it's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. <clears throat> All, everything uh, on here has been consecrated. It's very special. The um, one cloth that I think people don't really always know about is the corporal. And that's the large cloth that I'll put on the table or the altar server will spread on the table to put underneath all the other um, items. And you'll notice that Father usually keeps the items, the crucible, the chalice and all that, all on top of this because if any particle falls down. We want to save that because that every particle, every, every molecule in that thing has been, the substance is now Jesus Christ. So it's very special. And they fall down here. Then when we, at the end of Mass, we actually fold it up so that all the pieces fall in there. We don't, we don't lose anything. And the same thing, the, uh, the cloth or the uh, purificator that we use uh, when we uh, uh, take the precious blood and we'll wipe the cup and all that. A lot of times, droplets will be on there. That is Jesus Christ. Now, if we had a, uh, a microscope that could see into the spiritual world, and we just looked at it, just the, the smallest particle, you would see all of, all of Jesus there. You would see every part of him, his, his uh, humanity and his divinity, because every part of it. If you get one drop of his blood, you have received everything Jesus can give you. So, every item on here is very important, and you'll notice that it's all very, very nice. It's something. Uh, you know, uh, the movie, what is the name of that movie? Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. I don't know if anybody saw that. 
Uh, but they bring out this, this uh, wooden cup and say, oh, this is what Jesus used because, uh, because he was uh, a carpenter. And that's all he, uh, you know, that's, that's what they had. But that's not true. It's very unlikely that Jesus had a wooden cup. The Jewish people reverenced their, their uh, ceremonial uh, drinking cups, their, their chalices. So that would have been a very ornate one, probably. And that's why ours are ornate, because it's holding the precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So the last uh, item on here I think uh, you probably recognize is a monstrance. And again, it's usually made out of a precious metal, gold, gold-plated, or silver. And this is what we use to, uh, to venerate, to, uh, to worship uh, the Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And we do that at uh, Eucharistic Adoration. And all of these things are made very special. They're all consecrated. And they're, they're made special for the, the Mass. So I think that's all I have to show up here. And I'm going to ask Dr. Mora back up, and we'll take questions. Anything from today or actually in the last five days, if you have any questions at all.